This is episode number 93, featuring watercolor artist Mario Robinson. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plein Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping. The podcast is brought to you by Lil It All, art instruction video, delivering quality art video workshops for over 30 years. That's substantial. Check out their amazing lineup of top painters, including a brand new video from artist Mario Robinson, our guest, at lilyartvideo.com. That's lily, L-I-L-I, artvideo.com. The interview is also underwritten by the second annual Figurative Art Convention and Expo. It's one of the great ways for any artist to perfect their skills and learn figurative and portrait painting. And it's really for museum quality artists. So instructors include a lineup, a massive lineup, too long to list here, but uh, people like David John Casson, Michelle Dunaway, Casey Baugh, Mario Robinson, Sadie Valeri, Bert Silverman, the legend, and many, many more. It's going to be held in Miami in November. You don't want to miss it. It's called FACE, the Figurative Art Convention and Expo. You can learn more at figurativeartconvention.com. And coming up after the interview, I'll be answering some art marketing stuff. But first, let's get right to our interview with Mario Robinson. Well, Mario, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you for having me on. Well, I, I'm really honored. You, you know, you are doing some amazing things. You do um, beautiful work. And one thing that a lot of people know you for is your figurative work, but they they uh, need to know more about your strategy on, on plein air painting and, and painting the figures in plein air. And so I thought it'd be mm-hmm. good to um, talk about that because it's not something that gets talked about very much. Uh, but let's start from the beginning. How did this whole art thing happen for you? Oh, wow. So we're going to go all the way back. to all, Way back. <laughs> well, um, I was actually born in Oklahoma, And um, my family moved to New Jersey when I was uh, 11. So up until that point, uh, there wasn't a lot of art education there or exposure. Uh, There were a couple of kids drawing in in the classes uh, that I was kind of drawn to, and they would draw pictures for me. This is during Star Wars, like Star Wars period. So I would get uh, this one particular kid uh, to draw Star Wars figures. Uh, So fast forward to us moving to... uh, the Jersey Shore, which was a little bit more advanced. And uh, we had an open house in fifth grade and, and the teacher told me, you know, Mario, why don't you be in charge of drawing the presidents for the uh, open house? So we'll put them all in the hallway. And I'd never drawn before. So I naturally picked up a pencil and started drawing George Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson. And I drew about 20 presidents. Uh, and the uh, I remember the reaction from a lot of the parents were like who who did this and uh you know she pointed this skinny kid over on the side and it was just uh from there um i took talented and gifted art in sixth grade so i would go back and forth to the high school and take an art class and come back uh to the grade school so i was kind of um i I wouldn't say advanced but i was showing promise so the art teacher worked with me and let me do my own kind of projects from magazines and I would draw a lot. And she just so happened to have a dream school, which was Pratt Institute in Brooklyn that she didn't get accepted to. So she made it her mission to get me accepted. And I worked on my portfolio from sixth grade to my senior year and got a full scholarship to Pratt Institute. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's funny how things work. Uh, what, what, uh, what was her name? Uh, her name was Louise Elvinger. Yeah, she's still living. She yes, she 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 was actually young when I was in school. I I, I perceived her to be older, but she was only in her thirties, uh, and she retired from teaching uh, 
three years ago. Well, she must be very pleased to know that she had such a huge impact on a career like yours. Uh, yes, she. I would go back and visit her uh, periodically, and I think the Pratt thing was was her biggest uh, uh, kind of accomplishment. And uh, she she really she really was proud that we were able to accomplish something like that because my parents weren't really that that interested, and she even came to the house. Uh, and, and had to talk to them about um, not discouraging me and, and letting me uh, draw and, and do things, uh, artistic pursuits rather than, you know, other stuff the kids were getting into. Um, and she actually took me to Portfolio Day at Pratt, and she was very instrumental. So she, she, uh, she's responsible for a large part of, um, you know, what it is that I do today. So talk to me about Pratt. So you get out of high school and you go right into Pratt? Uh, great question. So, no, my parents were, my stepfather and my mother were civil servants. Uh, my stepfather had actually been in Vietnam, so I was very comfortable with living on uh, Air Force bases. We moved around a lot. Uh, so my mom was like, you know, this art thing might not take you too far, even though you have a scholarship. Why don't you try something practical and get a trade? Uh, so the recruiter came around in the lunchroom, and I just happened to say, you know, let's talk. And he, I told him that I loved art and stuff like that. And he said, well, you can do art in the army. Long story short, I, there was no program for art in the army. Um, so I served uh, in the army before going to art school. And how long did you serve? Two years? Uh, four years. Four years. All right. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Mm -hmm. so, so the recruiter, yeah, so the recruiter may have stretched the truth a little bit. He, he totally stretched the truth, um, and I think that he was doing his job, <laughs> but he, he wasn't really looking out for the arts or, you know, my, um, I guess, what looked like a pipe dream to a lot of people. Uh, I'm, looking back, it was very realistic to me, um, you know, as I sat in the libraries and read art magazines in high school, and um, it, it was very realistic, the goals that I had set for myself, but I think hearing him out saying them out loud to people, it just sounded like um, pie in the sky. Yeah. So, well, especially know, so if, they, was, if they were someone who didn't really understand it or didn't understand what was possible. Sure, sure. So I don't, I don't fault um, anyone really for the way everything turned out. Um, I, I think I needed discipline. Um, I was disciplined in my uh, art creating um, and uh, – the willingness to work hard, but as far as, you know, being young and immature, I think the Army helped me. Uh, that component, going into art school, I would see people sleeping all day and, you know, their tattoos and their mohawks, and I just had a different mindset when it came to the classroom and even working uh, with a small group at night. Um, you know, we would paint and draw from life. So it kind of, even though I started late, it, it kind of, catapulted me on the, uh, the discipline side. What did you do in the Army? Were you stationed uh, outside of the U.S.? Uh, no, I was never uh, deployed, thankfully. Um, I got out right before uh, Desert Storm. Um, so I was, I was more of like a, a specialist uh, in the Army. So I had very specific duties, uh, you know, weapons and things like that. Um, but it was just like a nine to five job. You know, after you finish your basic, I did basic training in uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And uh, I just remember the, the bus pulling up at night and all of us being ushered off and the yelling and the haircuts. And it, it was just a, it was just a, a just a, an experience, you know, as a, as a 18 year old, um, well, man at that point, but um, I was, I was happy and relieved to, to go to art school because it was more of my element. You know, I was drawing while I was in the army and, you know, trying to keep it going in the barracks, but there's nothing like being in, you know, a creative uh, atmosphere. So was there a particular thing that occurred in the army that actually helped your art career? Um, actually, when I was, I was getting out of the army, I was, they all knew uh, where I was stationed that I, I loved to draw and, um, 
one of the superiors, he came up and he, he said, what are you always doing? You know, so we see you with your head down and you're, you know, you're, you're sketching and doodling. He said, if you can uh, draw one of the, uh, uh, the sergeants here and make it look like him, we'll actually uh, get your release papers and, and you can get out early. I think it might have been a month or so. And uh, I looked at that as, as a joke, but he was ultimately serious because when I finished it, he looked at the, uh, the, uh, the staff sergeant that I was drawing, and he, I remember the words distinctly in my head. He said, he, he got you meaning he, he captured you. Right. And, uh, that, <laughs> that above anything was, uh, was like just light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, cause I was just ready to, whether I was going to fail at it or, or, or make something of it, I was just ready to see where, where it went. You know, it, it was just being kept from me after, you know, six years of really working hard on a goal and then having the, the goal line move back, I was just excited to, you know, to, to start that life, not, not lamenting any other um, things that had happened in the, in the army, but I was just ready to, to get out on, on the water and, 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 and test it out. Well, and, and it sounds like, um, it sounds like you were fortunate that Pratt continued to give you the scholarship after you got out of the service. It, it was deferred. Yes. Yes, and I think that the uh, the department chair he's passed on now. His name was Elliot Gordon. He saw something in me that um, um, he, he saw my passion. He saw the rawness um, of it. So it wasn't any any fault of my own um, that uh, I wasn't going to be able to take a, take on the opportunity because I think he saw something in my eyes that was uh, relentless, and um, I got accepted. On, on just drawings. I had no paintings or any other medium. I, I had all drawings. So, so I, I Mario, just, if, you, if you could give us a kind of a brief overview of what, what the program was like at Pratt. Was it more like an academic uh, program where you're drawing casts or was it um, models from life? Um, what, what, what was the program like? It was, it was extensive. They treated it like, um, like it, like you were going to be um, working um, at a job with deadlines, even if you were going to be doing studio work for yourself, you know, they treat it that way. So um, going in, uh, your found, what they call foundation um, is drawing one um, and it's, it's painting one, which is more color theory. Um, and we did draw from, from models. Um, a lot of the instructors, um, they didn't, they didn't have a lot of academic training as far as what we see today, because we, we're talking about the early nineties. Um, so we, we did do uh, drawings from the model and um, it was mostly uh, linear. It's mostly gestural. Um, and uh, the painting program, I had a painting professor. He was a little bit of a, of a rebel looking back on it now because he would teach us like any old master, um, style of painting and he would take us to the Met. So it, it was a pretty rigorous program, but it was, it was a lot of, um, how do you say, um, intuitive kind of things going on, which I didn't like. So as I, as I mentioned before, there was um, a group of about 10 of us that would get together at night and we would get our own model and we would kind of, um, kind of do more serious, um, drawings and paintings, right. uh, so, pastels, oils at night. So everybody so else was, was kind of focusing on abstract modernism and squirt gun art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, when did, when did the idea of going outdoors strike you? How did that come about? Mm. Um, I had always liked, uh, paintings that, that were executed in, in sunlight uh, particularly drenched sunlight. Uh, so for my earliest paintings, that was uh, kind of what I had in my mind that my work would look like. Um, so I was doing pastel for the first 10 years of my career after I graduated uh, college. Um, it just so happens my mother didn't really want the fumes uh, of the oil paint in the house. 
So I would paint during the summers on, on college breaks. I would paint pastels. Um, so it was a little difficult to paint outdoors with the pastel dust and everything. Um, so I started looking towards watercolor in 2003. And uh, that's when it really took off. I was setting up scenes outdoors. Um, and I really loved how, how the light kind of played off of uh, flesh tones. Uh, so I, I just really loved it. So I would say from the very beginning, uh, even now, if you look at my body of work, may, maybe 20% of it is done inside. That might be even be an exaggeration, might be less than that. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I just love the cool light and the way it uh, bounces off of architecture and, uh, and flesh tones. Well, what I find interesting is you're, you're doing pastels, watercolor, and oils. And mm-hmm. uh, they all kind of have the same feel. Like you're, you, you manage to get this transparency in your oil work, which feels a little bit more like watercolor. Which, is that accurate? Mm-hmm. Oh, sure, sure. When I was painting the, the pastel, I was trying to get the feel of, of watercolor. Uh, I really love the the transparency and the uh, the the light bouncing off of the paper. And when I saw Andrew Wyatt's work in 1995 at a library in a book, um, it all kind of came together for me because I was already painting my pastels in, in that kind of uh, uh, kind of sensibility. Uh, so. It's just, I, I think that's how my eye sees it. It's not anything like to copy uh, his work or, or Homer or anybody in particular. It's just, I don't, I don't like the heavy chroma um, of a scene. I, I like to kind of paint a little bit more naturalistic. Uh, so I'm not trying to make different mediums do something that they're not able to do. It's just, if I can bend it and meld it into that aesthetic, um, I'm more I'm more happy with uh, the outcome. So can can you articulate a little bit about um, how you paint? Let's just say for for discussion in oils, because I, as I look at your work um, and that sense of transparency, you're you're right. You don't have a lot of chroma, uh, a lot of brilliant bright color, um, but it feels colorful in some ways, and some some of them feel kind of um, moody or maybe gray, but how, how do you go about mm-hmm. that in an oil setting uh, versus watercolor? Because it, it, do you paint really, really thin? Do you do a lot of glazing? What's, what's your process like? Um, I paint a lot of the oils on, um, on paper. So I like the arches, uh, the arch uh, oil paper. Uh-huh. And what I'll, I'll do is uh, on the first pass, I'll just Thin the oil paint all the way down um, with with Gamsol, and just really thin it out, and just have it runny and, and and just very translucent. And then I'll start. I'll go about blocking in uh, my shadows with uh, like a uh, maybe like an ivory black and a raw umber and a little white in it, so it's like a warm gray. So then everything I put on top of that, uh, the glazes kind of pick that up a little bit and then I'll um, then I'll start to push um, a little bit of the of the color in, in certain areas and I think that gets more tension than everything being um, drenched in color um, so I like to lay back a little bit and it's, it's I think it's about what what I'm choosing also to paint um, I like to paint on the beach I like to, to paint um, sand and sky and white walls. And so a, a lot of times that kind of dictates, um, uh, which parts of the palette that I'm, I'm going to push. And then with the watercolors, I'm starting with just a basic, um, gray tonal wash, which is a burnt umber and an ultramarine blue, which makes a very nice neutral gray. So I can cool it or warm it based on which one I'm, I'm really putting in, uh, putting more in the mixture. Uh, and then I'll do maybe four or five layers of that. And then every, everything that I kind of glaze over that with watercolor obviously picks up that, uh, that undertone coming through 
Um, then I, if I want a punch of color, I can work with direct color, like really direct, um, and it's still neutralized by the, uh, the underpainting. So that's kind of like the secret weapon. And with pastel, I'm, I'm not having to do the gray thing too much. I'm just, I can really just choose certain colors because of the way the, uh, the pastels are gradated. Uh, so I don't have to really do a gray kind of thing at all. I can just, the, the, the colors are very close to each other uh, as far as value. So I can just control it. I don't want to put you in a difficult position, but it's my job to do that. If you had to, <laughs> if, if you had to make a choice and you had to say, mm -hmm. okay, I only could use oils, watercolor, or pastel, um, oh. what would the choice be? Wow. Oh, wow. I hate when people don't answer these kind of questions. Yeah. So I'm just going to jump out there. Uh, I, I would say watercolor because I can tap into the, to the kind of spontaneous nature uh, of my personality, and I can also settle into a, a long kind of um, uh, long version of, of a painting. I can dry brush it and pull the detail up and kind of be satisfied with it. Mm -hmm. So if I had to choose one, it, it would definitely be watercolor. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that it, it seems difficult to me for mastering one medium, let alone two or three. You seem to have done well in, in all three. Uh, talk to me about Thank the you. figure, painting the figure outdoors. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who are listening to this who, who are primarily landscape artists. And if you look at the your website, which is MarioRobinson.com, most of the work you see there tends to be uh, figures, uh, and most of them seem to be figures outdoors. Let's talk about mm -hmm. about that discipline and what you learn from doing it that way versus from photographs. Oh, sure. Um, as we talked about in the beginning of the of the podcast, um, you know, I do get a lot of attention. Uh, in the art world for my portraits, uh, largely because of the, the, the market demanding it and the galleries um, kind of pushing it a little bit and getting requests for it. Um, but my, my passion definitely is, is uh, plein air painting and being out in nature. And I would release much more of the work um, into the market because it, it's just something that I've, I've done my whole career. Um, so it, it's turned into like kind of like my little uh, secret garden, if you will. Private uh, obsession. People are, are you, oh, absolutely. And it's, it, I think it's becoming more of an obsession because um, I'm not having the demand and the, uh, like, people in, in that world that I've created for myself to make suggestions or, um, you know, be totally in it with me. So it, it's kind of something that's my own. And when people find out that I, that I do it, it, it's it's a shock to them, but it's not a shock to me. Um, so, um, the, as far as painting the scenes, what I'll do is um, what I'm really trying to do is document, you know, my life, the places that I grew up. Um, that's mostly what the work is. So, um, whether it's a church, whether it's uh, a corner store, whether it's the, the ocean, I'll make a conscious decision as to, you know, what I really want to say about these places that I've lived and, and grew up in. So for instance, um, I lived around the corner from the church we used to attend uh, in Keyport, New Jersey, and I walked past the church every day. So um, I painted a, a, a picture, um, a watercolor of the church, and that, that, that kind of satisfied me for the moment. But then I started deciding that I want to put the people that were very important to me um, and, and kind of raised me and knew me when I was a youngster. Uh, I wanted to put them in the scene because the church was very vital to their lives as well. So um, around 2010 and 12, I started doing um, paintings of them, you know, in the scene. So there are very, very distinct decisions that I'm making about um, the church, first of all, but then taking that a step further and saying, you know, who are the people that make that church important to the community? Um, so those are decisions that I'll, I'll make on the fly. I'll do sketches. I work a lot from sketches. Um, I work a lot from um, some photo reference, but it's, it's mostly on the seed because the light just, you can't get that kind of light in photographs. So 
things that are very important to me, um, I'll make sure I'm doing them on the spot uh, from life. So, yeah, my, de- my decision to put people in scenes is, uh, is I, mm, I like to have that as a secondary kind of option because they, they kind of take a lot of attention away from a scene and I like architecture. So if I put somebody in a scene with the architecture, I want to make sure that they're actually of the scene rather than taking a random person and putting them somewhere they don't, that, where they don't really belong. So I noticed in looking at your, your work that um, the, the portrait work or the, I, I hate to call it portrait because it's really, it's, it's more genre based, you know, it, it's, it's people, but they're not traditional portraits, you know, the, the, you've managed to capture a really interesting mood uh, in all of the paintings that I've seen it, that there's um, very few that are staring straight into, into the canvas, like, you know, oftentimes a traditional portrait. Do you have a particular way that you try to accomplish mood when you're painting? Oh, sure. Um, the first thing I like to do is analyze the, the person and what I know about the person. Um, and some people just have really interesting profiles. Uh, that's, that's one thing that I, that I kind of pick up on. The second thing is I try to make the viewer as, as comfortable as possible when they confront a subject. A lot of times a, a person's gaze, depending on who they are, can have a very strong countenance and, and be a little intimidating uh, because I know that these people that I'm painting at the end of the day aren't, you know, fashion models and family members of people that are, that are looking at them. So there has to be something, there has to be a hook to actually catch a person's attention and hold it. And that, that's really why I put the architecture in or a place because that makes it a little bit more of a universal theme also. Um, something reminiscent of what people see, whether it's, you know, the beach, um, a landscape in the background. Uh, so there, there's a lot of different things that go into, uh, you know, posing a person a certain way. And it's not a, it's not a, formula at all. It's just a matter of, you know, what I know about the person, what their best characteristics are. Uh, and some people that just have really nice eyes. So if, if that's something that I really want to accentuate and take advantage of, I will turn them a little bit closer to uh, a frontal position. But I, I do kind of like the informal uh, pose, uh, you know, just a little bit away from the, the catching the eye of the viewer. It just allows them to observe a person in a scene just a little bit more com- more comfortable. You know, when we're confronting each other, it's, it's a little awkward if you catch someone's eye and you look a little too long into their eyes. It's, it's, a, it, it's not, it doesn't feel natural. So I don't want to push that into, um, in, into the ether and make that a thing when it's, it's not really a thing unless you're watching TV or something like that. So mm-hmm. it, it's very rare that you just, you're having a staring contest. <laughs> we used to do that when we were younger. It, it just got weird. Yeah. It, looking that far into someone's eyes, is, is it, it can be intimidating, no matter who they are, even if it's a child. So are there, uh, are, are there things that you've learned painting figures outdoors uh, that people need to know about that uh, that's different than you know, it, it, a lot, like I said, a lot of the people listening to this would be purely landscape. A lot of them are trying to put figures in their paintings. Any particular mm-hmm. ideas or tips that would be helpful to them? Yeah, yes. Um, remember that they're human beings and not dolls. So if you could choose a sitting scene, um, if a person's um, just a little older or, or, or not able to stand that long, um, just make sure it's a sitting scene and the, and the person is comfortable. Um, also, the subject is the most important part of the painting. So, you know, when you're painting outside, there's there's wind, there's there's bugs, there's there's things going on. Um, there's, there's people looking because people ultimately like to see paintings outside. They like to gather. So, just make sure that you're sensitive to the model and what they're comfortable with. Uh, make sure you take more breaks. Um, than you do in the studio. A lot of times people paint 20 minutes and then I think it's a five minute break. I, I would do probably, I do more, more like a 15 
and then a 10, um, then remember that the light is going to change. So going into a situation, um, make sure that you're documenting what time you show up and what time you actually start. I like to get there about a half hour earlier and get set up. So make sure you're out the door and you're at the same spot that you were painting the previous day. Um, watch the weather reports before you just kind of jump in to something. And if you have a model, you're going to have to coordinate that. So make sure you, you have at least a few days uh, where it's going to be the same conditions. Um, how, many these, these days typically, that, how many days typically will you take with a model um, when you're outdoors painting? Uh, five days is, is what I keep like to keep it. Fortunately, with watercolor, um, after the fourth day of painting, it, it, it can tend to get overworked. Um, so the first day I'll, I'll take um, and I'll, I'll sketch the whole thing. And I'll actually sketch it without the model so I can get all the background components nailed down without having them there. And then the second day, I'll take um, time to, to sketch it and, and put the model in the scene. Um, and then that half the day, and then the following three days, I can kind of work it for, I like to get six hours at least um, with the model. Uh, so after five days, I, I should have it pretty much wrapped up now do you uh, so, and if, oh go ahead sorry oh and if i have sketches i can i can kind of work that and kind of you know piece it together and pull it together in the studio if i have to but i know after having a model out there you know for four days it it, it gets it cuts into schedules you know somewhere around two the mid 2000s it got a little bit uh, more difficult to have people you know out and away from their phones and it was much easier in the, in the late 90s and the early 2000s so it's changed a little bit on that regard as well now how, how much uh, teaching are you doing I try to keep it to maybe four workshops a year um, I'm not teaching anywhere regularly uh, so I'll do maybe four dates uh, Per year, and that's normally maybe like anywhere between a, a three-day workshop or or a five-day workshop. Uh -huh. and, um, and so I, I like. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And and what what are you uh, what are you finding that people are most craving when they're trying to learn from you? What what is it specifically that they're going to you for? There, people when they when they kind of come to my class and confront my work, they they just mostly really want to know. Um, what are the materials? Um, I've seen people with 30 or 40 year old oil painting brushes coming in to paint watercolor. Um, the, the muffin pans, I use a very specific measuring system for measuring water. Um, and weirdly enough, all this stuff has become normal to me and I've just kind of found my way but people still are very confused as to what brushes, um, what palette, what paper. Watercolor is something that is, it seems a little bit underground. So it's not like oil paintings where you can kind of search the web or you can um, just hear it in the air uh, because most people are painting oil. So you can just pick up things, even in the magazines, very quickly and easily. You, people know that you need oil painting brushes, you need canvas, um, things like that. But that's the big thing is really um, more than, you know, there's technique and everything, but just getting it right as far as the materials and um, what they need. Because everything makes a big difference. You know, paper can make a big difference. Um, you know, the weight of the paper, the brushes, synthetics versus sables. Um, so you can, you can kind of, I'm a little bit of a nerd in that regard because, you know, there's plenty of time for painting and drawing and, you know, getting that part right, which is a whole, that's a whole different spectrum. But that's, that's really the biggest thing. People are shocked when they see the, the materials that, that I use. Now, what about, I don't know why. I'm curious about why you're painting oil and paper and not using canvas. Ah, uh, I tried, um, I tried working on boards and 
you know, masonite. And I just don't like the give of a canvas because I've painted on paper for so long. When I first started painting my pastels, I was painting on watercolor paper and then obviously painting watercolor uh, on watercolor paper. So it just seemed like a natural progression. Uh, I think artists in general are creatures of habit. So when I found that technology, I was just so happy because it, it, it just still feels like a natural progression uh, and I don't have to change my sensibilities from working from one medium to the next because I do work in, you know, three different mediums, really four with the drawing, you know, on paper. So, so it just feels organic. When you said that technology, I assume you're referring to oil paper? Yes, yes. They had tried a few different papers. People were actually just selling watercolor paper um, and other things to try to, to, try to get that... Uh, uh, that look to be able to paint on, on paper. Yeah. But a few years ago, they, they actually made the technology that much better. And uh, a lot of people do think they're, they're watercolors when they see my oils. Cool. All right. Well, what this is, this has been fascinating to me. What, what are you finding um other than the materials? What, when you have students who are in your workshops what are the areas mm -hmm. that they, they typically are um, missing, you know, that let's assume that they've been painting already. Are there particular things that you find common problems with most people attending workshops so that the people listening to this might learn what they could be focusing on? Mm, oh, yes. The, the first thing is, is probably a no-brainer is, is creating a, a, a really tight, detailed drawing to be able to put color in. Um, I've had people mystified that they just can't come in and do it, uh, do a portrait a la prima with no pencil lines or, or any composition laid out. And the, the, the second thing, I think the biggest thing with people that take my classes um, is my monochromatic block-in. So the way I block in everything, people think it's the grisaille is reserved for oil painters and they never really connect the dots um, to kind of bring the values down and make the colors more naturalistic when you're putting them on the paper because the watercolor is so transparent of a medium. Um, if you put it down on, on white paper, it just pops. So you're never really able to control the, the, the chroma because you can't go back and add white and dilute it, uh, dilute a glaze and, and put anything on there. You can't fix it. So once you, once you put a red, say you're painting a flower, once you put a red, on that on that white paper, it's just gonna pop, and, and you've you've already lost control. So um, I think that's the big value, the big takeaway. So my, most students, when they uh, when they start with the monochromatic block in on the first day, they don't even want to add the color because it's so soft and whispery, and um, they say the color is just really distraction. They they really like the the look of the of the block in because the grays and you know controlling the values. You can really see it a little better. It's like a vintage uh, black and white photo. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, then the last thing I would say, once, once the block in is done, the next thing that they realize is you can actually work pure color uh, over that. So, um, and I think the, the other thing is how thin I'm keeping the glazes. A lot of people look at the black, uh, the blacks in my work, and they just, they, they don't realize that I'm not thickening the mixture or anything from, from the beginning to end. The, the mixtures are just about the same. So everything is, is, is thin and translucent. So that's where you get the optical kind of effect when you, when you look at the work because I'm not using a lot of opaque mixtures in it. I'm, I'm keeping light running through it. Um, so that's another thing that people take away from it. It's like, you know, you can keep uh, very, very transparent uh, glazes on your paper without um, having these blotchy, opaque darks. Um, so it just it's just more dazzling. So I'm curious. People if, mostly leave happy. I'm sorry, I didn't mean mm -hmm. to interrupt you. I'm, I'm curious. Okay. Uh, let me just stop you there for one second. And that is that in uh, in oil painting with glazing, we're typically suspending the the transparent oil into a, a medium or or some something that will lay on top of something that's already dry 
in a watercolor mm-hmm. environment, are you are you glazing again with water and, 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 and pigment, or do you use some kind of a special medium at that point? Uh, no, you're just using water and pigment, and it just the same principle applies uh, as it does with oil. It has to be dry before you apply a next the next uh, layer uh, or else everything will just wash off and uh, it won't actually uh, mix. It, it'll just kind of, it'll be a, what they call a wet into wet uh, technique at that point. Yeah. So no, do you, do you start I, with dry paper or do you start with wet paper? Cause some watercolor artists wet their paper entirely before they start. Mm-hmm. Uh, I start with a, a dry piece of paper. So let's just say if I'm, if I'm starting with an eye socket, I'll, uh, I'll just kind of block in the whole, the whole eye area with the gray, and then I'll work around that. Rather than toning down the whole paper and losing that first uh, value of, of, of white, I want to kind of preserve that in other areas so I don't do a tonal uh, wash or anything. I really don't like wetting the paper because that's, that's like when you lose control and you're just kind of chasing it at that point um for for my aesthetic some people like the the loose uh kind of meandering uncontrollable unpredictable um property of watercolor and they they ride that wave but i looked at a lot of books from contemporary artists that they wrote and i just couldn't get there i couldn't i couldn't um because i had done pastel and oil you know as a student and as a professional i just couldn't take my hands off the wheel and just let it do what it wanted to do. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. Uh, Now, what do you do to keep yourself engaged and interested and keeping from getting bored? And are you doing anything on your own to kind of take yourself to the next level? Luckily, the art world kind of keeps me pretty busy. I like, I really like writing. So when I wrote my book in 2015, I took a whole year to do that. It kind of made me um, go over my body of work and kind of study it a little more than I'd I'd had in the past. Um, You know, putting the images in different chapters and writing about why I do certain things. Um, That was really cathartic. And it was, it was, um, actually something I really love to do. I've written for magazines and it was just, that was just like a, an appetizer, but writing something, um, that thorough, um, made me really enjoy it. So I'm, I'm probably going to be working on a drawing book here soon. Um, so that's going to be another project that I can kind of sink my teeth into, but outside of that, no, it's mostly just, you know, just drawing and painting and, just trying to go a little deeper into my personal narratives and uh, just, just staying on that path and not getting distracted because there's so many images on social media. And, you know, I hate to say this, Eric, but magazine I mean, is good information, but it can actually just kind of tempt you to, uh, it, it can inspire you as well, but it can tempt you to get a little bit out of your, out of the lane that you really kind of should be in as far as, subject matter. So that's something I, I kind of work on is not overdosing and, and just trying to um, live a little bit more life so I can put a little bit of that in the work rather than just always having, you know, uh, just crank out work. Right. So it's important to live life and, you know, be with your family and your friends and carve out time for that as well. You've you've developed a very successful career. Um, it appears, anyway, mm-hmm. that you're selling a lot of work. You have uh, limited edition and open edition prints that you sell. You sell originals through uh, multiple galleries. Uh, what mm-hmm. what was that like building your career to the point where you were able to sufficiently be a full time artist um, based on you know getting getting people to buy your work? How did you do it? Um, I, I, I would go to the Barnes and Nobles when I was starting out in, in the, uh, in the late nineties and I would see, um, the, like the same artists, like kind of like Bert Silverman and Max Ginsburg and Daniel Green and, 
even if they weren't having features, they were even in, they were in the workshop sections in the back, and there was always something um, about them uh, out there in 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 a, in a national kind of um, national exposure. So I, I I kind of got in my head. I said, "Wow, you can't really do a mom and pop shop and be a local artist. That that's probably going to phase out, you know, um, especially the small coastal towns that I live in." It was not a really big art scene. So I said, I have to kind of introduce myself somehow to the, uh, to a national audience. I mean, it sounds, sounded grandiose at the time because I had no idea. Um, there was no real internet. So I would write the, uh, the magazines. Um, and I didn't really have a big body of work. So I had to put a, put a pause on that just in case I, you know, they, they wrote me back. You know, what, what, what do you have? So I, I took about a year and a half and I created a series that I called, um, it sounds crazy, but um, the, the independent series, because I was working at that time creating limited editions for a company. And I was just very unhappy, you know, with what I was making. So I put them all in the closet and I, I wrapped them. These all pastels. I, I stacked them in the closet and wrapped them. And uh, I said, when I get to 10, I'm going to approach a magazine. So that's exactly what happened. I wrote uh, a magazine and got my first feature in uh, February 2000, um, 2001. And from there, I started building on, 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 on that exposure. And the phone started to ring a little bit more. Um, you know, the workshop thing wasn't that big. Uh, back then, but you know, one thing will lead to another thing and another article, and that's that's really how I built it. Um, and then being at the right place at the right time, you know, a few years after that, the internet started to kind of percolate, and um, I was able to send images, and I got my first gallery, and uh, in 2003, and um, had a small show in D.C., and from there. Uh, better gallery called uh, in Charleston, and then I kind of was uh, working in, a, in an American tradition. So Charleston's a big watercolor town. So I started getting better collectors, word of mouth, and then before you know it, um, you know the work is is selling, and then you're trying to keep up. And it, it kind of happened, um, thankfully, without me having to you know, work jobs and, and kind of support myself. Uh, I was able to just stay on the path and keep up with what I'd created, uh, a good problem to have, but um, I had a, a few sellout shows. So I was able to, you know, sustain myself from the, the, uh, the one man shows I was having uh, in the mid 2000s in Charleston. And that really gave me my push. And uh, I was able to sit back and think about ideas I was able to compose things, um, things like slow down uh, when I started, you know, to make money for my art. And, uh, and then, the, you know, the, the market kind of crashed down in 2008. And it was, Kinda. you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it crashed. It, let's, let's just say, call it what it is. It crashed. And uh, I think the cream always rise it to the top, no matter what, um, what field you're in, uh, what situation you're in. And a lot of people went running for the hills, but I think I built up a, a pretty stable infrastructure and the people that were supporting my work weren't um, even aware that there was a, a gas shortage at some point, gas had gone up. So it was kind of insular as far as, you know, the people I was dealing with, thankfully. Um, and I kind of wrote, was able to ride that storm based on, you know, the certain collectors that I was um, fortunate enough to have. So that's another thing. This is a kind of like a uh, relationship business. So it's, it's, it's good to, to build really strong um, relationships and, and associate yourself, you know, with people that are passionate and love this. And it's not going to be a kind of like a fair weather friend. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'll be able to sustain you through something like that, God forbid. So any any um, final tidbits of advice 
to people either about um, building your career as an artist or maybe just painting. Um, anything you want to leave people with? I, I just want to implore, um, whether it's young artists or artists working today, just I know it's difficult because there are pressures from, from the industry and, and, um, and critics, but just try to make the most personal work that you can make um, and make, make sure it speaks to you first and, and kind of um, ignore the trends um, because obviously trends are the kiss of death. And just, I think things will, will happen and, and break up if you're, if you're being the most unique, the most uh, genuine version of yourself. Um, I think that's the thing that I hate to say sells, if you will. But I think that's what people look for. And um, I think that's the thing that's going to sustain any artist and, uh, and obviously work on your craft. You know, it's not about all about, you know, what you're saying is how you're saying it and just make sure you're you're operating in excellence. You know, every time you go into the studio or painting outdoors, make sure that that you would actually want to purchase it. How much you know, editing sure do you do? Oh. In, in other words, uh, oh. out of all the pieces that we see that make it to the galleries or the website, how many get destroyed or her burn <laughs> cried on um or cried on that's good uh, cried on <laughs> it's watercolor you know at the end of the day it's like oh goodness it just ruined it um the sketches are are, are super important and and then like i'll do i'll do studies that are kind of really really kind of close to the execution of the uh, the finished painting. So I'll work up the sketches and I'm, I'm a big composition person. So I'll take, I'll take the person out of it. I'll, I'll paint the scene by itself. Um, some things just don't work. So I would, I would say um, out of, let's just say in a month, if I did five paintings, um, there's at least double that between sketches and paintings that didn't make it. So there's 10 things at least laying on the floor somewhere um, because I, I definitely want to make sure that when it comes out of, um, you know, my studio, I want to make sure that it's on par with what I've tried to create as far as quality. Um, I just don't want to phone it in. So if something is just, is just not hitting, um, I'll, I'll just scrap it and, and start over. How do you, you know, know when you're not hitting it, though? Because you, you have, I, I, I think one of the hardest parts for an artist is to know when your painting is is decent or when it's not. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. you, know, you, you want to get an outside perspective. What do you do? How did you train yourself to know when they were really ready? Um, I, I go mostly on emotion. Um, I, I don't really like pretty pictures. So I'll be honest with myself. If if it's just a, a a vanity thing, or you just want to show how you could how you could paint a sky, or w w I don't look at different elements of the painting. I, I look at it from from an emotional uh, standpoint of you know does does it make something make make my gut kind of kind of quiver? Um, did I do the person justice? Because of the people that I paint and draw, I've I've known for a very long time. Most of them from childhood. And um, I have a respect level for them to release something out into the world that's going to actually um, say what I need to say about them in a very respectful uh, manner. So if there's something in it that, that puts them in a bad light or something like that, I just won't release it and I'll, I'll just scrap it. Um, but I, I have to look at my work and, and, and feel something, um, an emotional attachment to it and it's intuitive because sometimes it'll look good. You know, sometimes that that's the trick too. Sometimes you might even be able to sell it and you just can't just for me, lower the standard on, on the emotive response that a work is going to have because there's so much artwork out there. You know, my goal is not to release more imagery. You know, it, it, it has to be about the, uh, the story that I'm, I'm trying to tell. So if it's not hitting on an emotional plane, I I just level. I, I won't I won't release it and I'll scratch it. And people around me are good at going through the garbage. 
so I'll just rip it up because <laughs> that that's happened way too much. <laughs> but you have to it's, it's watercolor paper, so I just or sketches, I just rip it up and uh yeah, just just scrap it. But you know, I think as an artist we we're hard on ourselves, but we we actually know the truth. You know, we we really do. We we know the truth, and sometimes it's hard because there's so many competitions going on out there, and there's you know, art is a commodity. It's like ripping up money. But if you care enough, and you're in the, in the position to to uh, to hold on to something or just destroy it, um, in the long run, you'll find that it's 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 worth it because what people see is is very lasting, especially with the internet. Um, I went on a Pinterest and I, I, I actually saw work that I hadn't seen in 15 years of mine, I actually screen grabbed it. You know, it's like things live on in so many different corners of the internet. It's like, you would probably wish, <laughs> I know with some of my old work, it's just like, I pick it apart, but you, you want to just be careful and curate yourself and be honest with yourself because there's, yeah. there's a lot of eyes out there. You never know who's watching. Well, selective editing is part of the imagery of an artist and and making mm-hmm. sure that everything is, is, like you say, something you want people to see and live on because th- this, is a, <clears throat> this is a problem we all have a tendency to have. I think is it, it's, it's uh, wow, look at what I just did. And then mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're anxious, <laughs> you have a couple glasses of wine, next thing you know it's on Instagram, and, and then you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yep. The the worst thing I, I in my book I talk about um the social media craze and just just kind of advise people to maybe slow down on the work in progress thing because you know there is that pressure to feed the beast um and feed your fans and you put one or two brush marks down and you're doing a WIP uh and putting a hashtag with it. But but you really need to execute that and work through that before you start getting feedback, you know, whether it's negative or positive, you know, with people saying, oh, that's great, I would stop there. You know, those outside voices come in and it starts to taint uh, your process. So, you know, it's just, you know, just live with it. Um, And it's good to get feedback, but let it be just a little bit further up the road before you, you know, you put it out there. Like you say, you have a couple of glasses of wine, you get you know, you're feeling good about yourself and it's out there on Instagram and, you know, the energy just peters out, you know, because you, you feel a sense of accomplishment because it's, it's been seen, you know? So I just, I just implore people to just kind of live with things and kind of rebel against this, this instantaneous instant gratification that we're, we're all experiencing right now. Yeah. Well, we all need a dopamine rush and that's why we do it. (laughs) I don't, you know, I don't want to take all the toys away yeah. um, because I'm guilty sometimes myself, you know, but just, I think balance is the word, you know, because this art thing is, it's, it's not a, it's not a sprint, you know, it's, it's a marathon. So um, just kind of thinking of yourself um, at the end of, of your career, looking back and, and just wanting to make sure you dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's and make sure you, you were doing things for the right, you know, the right reasons. You know, and I think I confront a lot of artists on all levels, and I, I will have to say, artists are really some of the most passionate people that I've I've ever confronted. You know, even people that aren't full time artists, they they care, they they are passionate, and um, it inspires me, especially retirees, people that um, are living their second lives that come to my workshops, and they they really care and uh, are passionate about making up for that, that time that they lost, you know, raising families and working jobs. And um, that really inspires me. I mean, I know that wasn't a question, but I just felt compelled to just, you know, take my hat off to people that are, you know, just trying to create art and passionate about doing it. Well, what's one thing that's been fun about this podcast is uh, I think we're up to almost 400,000 people. Uh, which oh, just wow. blows me away. You know, nobody ever heard of the word plein air 20 years ago, it seems. And, <laughs> and, and uh, pe- people are discovering it and, and people are 
showing up. You know, they want to learn. And uh, we had, um, at the last plein air convention, which was back in April, we had, um, I think, roughly about 200 people who showed up who had heard about the convention from the podcast who had never painted that never had picked up a paintbrush in their life. And they went there, they bought their materials there, they did their first painting there in their, in their or their first plein air painting there. And it's and, and they're getting so much joy out of that. So the, to me, what you said is, is so wonderful to see people uh, finding art and exploring it and, and, and then going to someone like you and learning the passion that you have. I think you've, you've been mm-hmm. a, a, a great role model for us all. Thank oh, you for thank doing you. this I podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Eric. I really do appreciate you having me on and allow me to talk about my other side, my plein air painting side, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, well, we, we, uh, we love what you do. Uh, where can people find out more about you? You can go to MarioARobinson.com. Uh, you can purchase my book on Amazon.com. Um, it's called Lessons in Realistic Watercolor. Uh, and my Instagram and Facebook are Mario A. Robinson also. All right. Outstanding. Well, Mario, thank you again. And I know you've got a new video coming up, so we'll, uh, we'll tell people about that uh, as it comes out. So thank you for your time today, and thanks for being on the Plein Air Podcast. Thank you so much, Eric. Bye-bye now. Well, in the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your questions. You can submit questions, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Uh, here's a question from Pam Ernst in Jasper, Arkansas. Pam says, how do you know when your art is good enough to start selling? Well, I think there's a couple of things you can watch. First off, I noticed uh, in my own particular case that um, I was getting more unsolicited positive comments. You know, oftentimes you can tell when people are trying to give you a compliment, oh, pretty colors or good composition or something, but they're really not giving you a full compliment. And so, you know, you're, you're like, okay, it really isn't all that good. So, but if you start getting unsolicited comments, wow, your work's really getting good, or, you know, this is good, that's a, that's a positive thing. But you really need to get some outside feedback. And so, our natural instinct is to go to our family or our friends. The problem is our fam- family and friends are not necessarily trained, don't necessarily have the eye. They might think it's good, and it might not be good in your world. So you want to ask people like fellow artists and ask them to be completely honest. You know, is my work ready? What does it need? Um, that kind of a thing. The other thing is you can go to a gallery owner or someone who's a gallery professional uh, or someone maybe uh, like a art gallery um, director or somebody like that. And just say, look, I I would like you to give me an opinion on my art. I don't want to get into your gallery. I mean, maybe I want to, but not right now. This isn't for that purpose. I really want to get you to give me a straight answer about my art. Is it ready? Is it not? What does it need? And I'm not really looking for compliments. I'm looking for the negatives. Uh, Let them off the hook so they can truly give you uh, the negatives. And that will really help you. I think... um, the other really reliable method is to enter art contests and salons because those things will really help you uh, because what it does is it puts you into a world where you're competing with other artists for a prize. And, you know, the, the names are not visible when the artists are judging you, so they're not picking up your names typically. And they're just looking at the paintings. And if you get selected as a finalist, or a runner-up, or you know, you win a category or something, that's validation that you're doing a good job because you're up against potentially hundreds or thousands of, of other artists. And so you, know, you enter something like the plein air salon, for instance, uh, and you, there's like 20 categories, you're going to have an opportunity if you win one of those categories. First off, you got something to talk about. You can say, hey, I was the winner of the portrait category. Uh, this particular month. And then, of course, you get entered into future um, competitions and you might win the big prize, which gives you a lot of publicity. So you might think about something like that. So that's kind of how you know. And you just want to get good outside advice as well and get people to be honest with you. But don't ask your mother because your mother will always tell you your paintings are beautiful. I know my my mother does that. Uh, Today's podcast was sponsored by Little at All Art Instruction Video. 30 years of creating videos. I think they were the, I think they originated the concept. 
check out their lineup of top painters and including a brand new one from Mario Robinson. Uh, Wei Han Liu, a new one from him. Nancy Tankersley, Michelle Byrne, uh, lots and lots and lots of others. Uh, really great stuff. And that's at Lilidol Art Video. You can find a shortcut. It's Lily, L-I-L-I, artvideo.com. Also uh, sponsored by the second annual Figurative Art Convention and Expo, one of the great ways for an artist to perfect their skills and learn figure painting for a museum, quality artists, and those who want to be a lineup of some of the best artists in the world. Really, really first-rate, top-notch. You don't want to miss this. It's held in Miami this November. It's a nice excuse to go to Miami when it's cold everywhere else. Uh, you can learn more at Figurative Art Convention. Dot com. And if you've not seen my blog where I talk about life and art, check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee. You can get it at coffeewitheric.com. Well, this is always fun. Let's do it again sometime, like next week. I'll see you then. My name is Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine, and I love plein air painting. I hope you can tell. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye.